All right, we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to begin with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for this day, for this chance to gather together as the people of St. Paul's Ivy to reflect on your call in our church, our mission and ministries, to give thanks for the many ways in which you are blessing us and have blessed us. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds this morning as we listen for you, as we give thanks for all your blessings. Give us wisdom and discernment, clarity of mind and heart. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, I officially call to order the uh, 2023 annual meeting of St. Paul's Ivy. The first order of business is the election of new vestry members. The vestry is, in case you're unaware, the lay governing board of the parish. It includes 12 members, um, and each member is elected to a three-year term. So uh, every year we elect four new members. You can see in your handout, uh, if you turn to the section listed 2022 vestry, it lists the eight members who are still serving on the vestry, um, who have at least one year left, and then the four nominees uh, to begin a three-year term. And I'm just gonna give each one of them an opportunity to introduce themselves. You may not know them. Um, Bill, I see you back there. Can we start with you? All right, he's coming out. The legend. <laughs> so our first nominee is Bill Achenbach, a longtime member of St. Paul's Ivy. Bill, do you want to say a few words about yourself by way of introduction? Should I shout through the window? Sure. <laughs> I am Bill Achenbach, Carol and my wife in the kitchen in there. We, uh, I'm a retired uh, finance guy. We live in Edmond, just down the road here. Uh, I moved there two years back. We, I just had to check my records, but uh, realized we joined this church in 1992. So. We're just beginning our fourth decade in St. Paul's idea. During that time, uh, I've had a number of different roles. Uh, many years as stewardship chair or co-chair. Uh, Justin may not even know this, but the director's uh, search committee for the... Uh, I did know that, yes. Director <laughs> before Justin. We're and the, uh, the best thing to say right about Bill is that when I was homeless for a couple months, when I first moved here, Bill and uh, Carolyn graciously took me in um, and adopted me as one of their children. So, uh, <laughs> uh, thank, thank you so much, Bill. Yeah. But uh, just wanted to uh, say that we certainly enjoyed our time here. I guess uh, looking at the whole picture, uh, what they wanted and they asked me as some institutional memory, so I'd be happy for you. Thank you, Bill. Welcome. Uh, and Bill and Carolyn attend the 815 service. All right. Uh, Laura. All right, Laura. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Laura Belair. Uh, my husband, Jeff, and I recently moved to the area. We live in Crozet with our three-year-old son, Jack, um, and are expecting our second child in April. Um, we uh, moved from Northern Virginia um, down to the Charlottesville area, primarily for the quality of life and a, just a slower pace. Um, I'm probably the newest member uh, on uh, amongst this group, not only to St. Paul's, but also to the Episcopal Church. I uh, grew up in the Presbyterian Church in Northern Virginia, um, where Jeff and I attended uh, before moving down here. And, we were uh, both very active members of the congregation. I served on the session um, up there, which is similar to the vestry, um, and was responsible for congregational care. 
Um, and so, you know, we did the Living Your Faith class in the fall, and we're also fortunate enough to be officially received into the church by Bishop Chilangani last uh, December. Um, so really excited when Justin reached out to me about this service and not only viewing it as a way to further get to know folks at, at St. Paul's, but also to um, to better serve the community. So looking forward thank, to it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Welcome. All right, Will. Yes, yes Will McConnell. Yeah. Hi, I'm Will McConnell, and I'm literally a lifetime member of the church, but my prodigal son, I had to be brought back in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this church is really my home, and when I say that, there is a parishioner who I sit with here who used to put me in a crib with another one of our parishioners. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this church has always meant quite a bit to me, and I'm just honored I'll have a chance to serve. Thank you, Will. All right, and Nick, I saw Nick around here. Yes, Nick. Uh, I'm Nick Macy. Um, uh, lived here for about 10 years this stretch from Chicago originally. Uh, been here in the church for almost two years now. Uh, as well, I'm married. Uh, and I also have kids, Molly, Annie, as well. um, Emmy, and uh, Zach. Uh, we live out in Crozet. Um, and I work at the uh, UVA as a position. Uh, serves as a, a one year term on the best for this past year, and I'm uh, happy to do uh, that. Wonderful. So these are our four nominees uh, Bill, Will, Laura, and Nick. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we approve their nominations uh, by acclamation. Um, is there a second to that motion? Second. second. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Well, I think we uh, can uh, official. Well, I guess that was the motion to claim. Now we got to do the actual vote. Okay. So, all in favor of uh, accepting these four nominees to the vestry, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. You're officially vestry members. Congratulations. Okay, at this time I'd like to call up our uh, current treasurer, Scott Gillespie, to offer a few words. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to recognize uh, Vic Dandridge who served in this role for 25 years before me. Um, I've only embarrassingly been able to last three years in the role as treasurer. I'm not quite sure how he did this job for 25 years, but I think we know him um, an incredible debt for his unwavering servitude in the church. He was a very strong financial position, so it kind of made my job easier. But uh, I get to turn the reins over to Lance Kimbrough, who uh, is known for his prowess on the track and cross country courses in Virginia. So I think his endurance uh, will survive a few more years. Um, for the numbers, uh, in 2022, we had estimated expenditures of about 838 thousand dollars on revenues of seven hundred sixty four thousand so if you can do the math there we were estimating a deficit of about seventy to seventy five thousand dollars for 2022 um, and this was kind of coming out of the pandemic not sure what our pledges and revenues would be and we have a significant reserve fund that we knew we could use to help grow um, through these couple years coming out uh, i'm happy to say that as we wrap up the books for 2022 which aren't totally finalized yet. But um, due to the generosity of all of you and the diligence of the staff to so kind of rein in expenditures, uh, we look like we will end up pretty much breaking even with expenditures of 826000 along with revenues of the same. So uh, we were able to make up about 75000 what we thought would be a deficit for the year, which is um, for my <laughs> uh, It was. It was great, and it's really due to the generosity of the parishioners not knowing, and also the work of the clergy to really bring in new members um, and see the church grow out of the pandemic. Um, I don't know if 
for somebody who's been here for over 20 years, there's a lot of new faces. Um, you probably haven't seen my face as much coming out of the pandemic. I hope to be back more, but um, there's been a significant turnover, um, and the generosity of everybody has been uh, much appreciated. Uh, for 2023, uh, it's looking like our expenditures will be around 872,000 on projected revenues of 842. So, still looking at a potential deficit of 30,000. Um, trying to shrink that as we come out of the pandemic, but all of these are estimates. Uh, the vestry, the finance committee, the staff. Um, we really just try to. It's a little bit of science, a little bit of art to try and figure out. Um, what the year is going to look like, even more so since 2020. But um, I think that those were going in the right direction. And if last year is any kind of forecast, I think that hopefully we can close that gap in one week deficit. Um, one thing that can really help with that, kind of the last thing I'll say um, as I roll out of the treasurer's position, is it's really helpful if people do fill out pledge cards. Um, I know a lot of folks give give consistently, they might not fill out a card and turn it into Mary and think, well, they, I've been giving for five to six years. They kind of know what um, I'll be donating to the church. It's true, but we don't like to rely on that. So the simple act of filling out that card really helps the finance committee, vestry, and staff plan for the following year. Um, so if there's anything I could kind of say that would really help us in our job, would be to fill that out. Even if it's conservatively, if you're nervous to fill out a card, kind of make that pledge. Um, you can always communicate with us throughout the year if something comes up, but it really helps us in that planning process, and it would be much appreciated. It would make Lance's job much easier, so I'll try to throw that out for him. Um, so all that said, the church is in a very strong financial position. Um, thanks to you all and the staff. Uh, it's been a pleasure serving in the role, and um, I will be cheering Lance on to the sidelines and helping him as he needs it. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Come up as well. So some of you will know this, um, but probably many of you don't know this. Uh, Scott mentioned our previous treasurer, Vic Dandridge, who had been in the role for a quarter of a century. Um, and had really taken leadership and mastery over all the dimensions of uh, finance at our church. And essentially, one day, he got sick and uh, was no longer able to serve in that role without any warning or uh, advance notice. Uh, fortunately for us, thankfully, uh, Scott had been working with him a little bit on the side and learning about our church management software and some of the details of our financial system, but he stepped in, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic, wasn't it? Uh, well, December 22nd. Yeah, so right, right before the okay. pandemic. <laughs> and um, Scott stepped in, and especially the first year, uh, had to put in a tremendous amount of time um, and energy to kind of keep the system going. I honestly don't know what we would have done without Scott. I, I mean that from, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it was a tumultuous time with the pandemic, with this transition out of nowhere, uh, and he stepped up. So I think we need to give him a huge Yes. Please. I think it's Scott. We owe you a debt of gratitude for sure. But to, to assume this role during the pandemic, it was a joke. And I think your guidance with the best reading and the finance committee calmly, assuredly, was very important. During the time period, we had no idea what was going on. So um, it's, it was more than just. A normal uh, role with I neglected to mention he even helped to supply for a PPP loan, yes. um, <laughs> something no treasurer has ever done before. Uh, so it certainly was a unique time. Um, today we are marking uh, a transition in the treasurer role, as Scott mentioned, and Lance Kimbrough, who is right here, uh, will be taking on the role. 
Um, I don't know, Lance, if you're planning on doing this for a quarter century or not, but um, uh, but he will he will hopefully be in the role for a good number of years. Um, and we are so thankful, uh, Lance, for you stepping up. Uh, Lance has an extensive background in accounting. Uh, he is an investment manager, and so he will bring all of that expertise and his endurance, I learned, your, your endurance as an athlete, uh, to this uh, essential role. So let's give Lance a round of applause. Today. All right, the baton has been passed, gentlemen. <laughs> Right. So I'm going to speak for a little bit about uh, what has happened at the church over the last year and, and where we're going, and then open it up for questions. Um, I'm sure you all have questions about our church, and um, we have a number of staff members here as well that can hopefully help answer some questions. Well, we are in uh, January of 2023, so we are about three years after the pandemic um, changed everything, so to speak, for us as a church. Uh, when I look back on this, uh, it's been a, a wild ride. I had one normal year here uh, before the pandemic hit. I think back to uh, recording YouTube videos in the sanctuary and Father Rick, another lifesaver, having all of his AB knowledge to help us produce these amazing YouTube videos. You all remember those YouTube videos that kept us going. And recognizing the importance of gathering uh, together, we transitioned to drive in church for a good year and a half. And we built the stage out there. And I learned that I could be a roadie. And I learned how to carry all the equipment and set it up and work the board and all of that. Uh, skills they definitely didn't teach me in seminary. But during that time, the church was able to hold together. People were able to come. Um, even though we were not allowed to gather in the sanctuary for worship, we could gather outside in our cars. And we started having a Sunday evening service on the grass over there by Kirk Lee. We were able to keep together in person. One thing that has become abundantly clear in the Episcopal Church and, and in many Christian denominations is that um, holding together during the pandemic was a key indicator of whether the church would come out of the pandemic with vibrancy. And churches that decided not to ever gather together and went completely virtual have really struggled, struggled to keep that uh, core group together. Um, so I think that was probably the best thing we did. I never imagined in my life that I would be doing drive-in church. And do you remember when I was preaching from the back of a truck? the beginning of it. I was in Amanda's truck and uh, standing in the back <laughs> preaching with a microphone. Um, it was like a revival service. <laughs> and then when we had to transition again outside uh, because of the resurgence last fall, or I guess not last fall, the, the fall before, um, we got a tent over there by the playground and we were able to worship outside. And I remember people sitting with their hats on and their coats, you know, like this. Uh, but they came, um, and we continued to gather and worship. And as a result, this church, while impacted by the pandemic in significant ways, has come through the pandemic fairly strong. Uh, as Scott mentioned in his talk, there has been a lot of turnover in the makeup of the congregation. Um, but because we stayed together as a church, many new people joined the church. So let me give you some numbers just this year as we were starting to have kind of a normal year, the 2022 year. Our average Sunday attendance in the first quarter of 2022 was about 117 people. So that is about half of where we were pre-pandemic, just as we're gathering again in the sanctuary. Um, as we went into the spring, summer, it jumped up to 124. As we hit the fall, it was 158. And we ended the year with 229. So throughout the year, as new people joined the church and as people came back to the church, our numbers started uh, to approach where we were pre-COVID. 
Um, so this is very encouraging. We'll have to see what happens uh, this coming year. Uh, but uh, it appears that we are beginning to uh, see a resurgence in attendance at worship. Um, as you heard, giving has been strong as well. Um, and uh, that has been a great blessing to us. We have something like $200,000 in reserves as well. So we knew that even if we went through a rocky period financially, we would have resources to draw on. Um, but you all have been so generous to keep us um, going strong. All right. So that is the basic numbers, the numbers for uh, where we are as we come out of the pandemic. Let's think a little bit about our ministries here and what's been going on. Um, and I think the best way to get at this is to, if you're not aware, I know many of you are new, to talk about who some of our staff members are. And make sure, I know some of them are here, so I might embarrass them and make them uh, stand up or wave. Um, Audie, your name happens to come first because you're the first in the alphabet. Um, so uh, we are very fortunate to have a full-time children's and youth minister here. Um, and without a doubt, one of the great strengths of this congregation is our children's and youth ministry. It's what we are known for. Um, Audie, how many kids were here at Easter on, in 2019? Remember that? Probably 80 plus, between 80 and 90. My life, I've never had to do a children's homily with 80 children around me. Um, it was it was wild, um, and and we have pictures. And we have pictures. That's right. And through the pandemic, many young families have continued to join our church, drawn to uh, the presence of many families in the 10:30 service, and also the formation programs that we offer. So. During the 1030 service, we have a children's chapel, um, which we offer most weeks. But we also uh, brought back in the fall our Christian formation. So we offer more than just uh, the children's chapel. From 930 to 1015 right now, we have on most Sundays Christian formation for all ages. Uh, we use a program called Godly Play for our young folks. Um, and so this is something I want to make sure, especially our young families here, are aware of um, and to spread the word about this. Um, we offer this so parents can come here and they can participate in the Rector's Forum and their kids can have formation. We offer this for middle schoolers as well. It's really remarkable to have this on Sunday, to have all of these options and opportunities. And without a doubt, in every experience in life, there are some silver linings and one of the silver linings of the pandemic, for me at least, and I think probably true for you too, Adi, um, is the emergence of a regular Sunday youth gathering, something that this church has not had for years. I don't know, when was the last time we had had that before the pandemic? Probably the my oldest. Right. Now 31. Now 31. But there was a hungering among young people. They couldn't gather, right, during the pandemic. And so we were able to create a safe gathering environment outdoors during the pandemic, and youth started participating in that. And it has continued. Um, and along with that, uh, it has allowed parents who want to attend the 5.30 contemplative evening prayer service to uh, drop their kids off in youth group and go to that service. So this is something new, actually, that the pandemic produced, another way in which young people are being formed in our church. There have been challenges, of course, as you know, families have come and gone, but Audie has uh, been a uh, rock star through it all and kept the programming going, kept reaching out to people. This position is all about relationships and being in connection with people. And so, Audie, I want to thank you for everything you've done to bring us to the other end of this. Well, the other thing that we realized during this pandemic was that we needed to up our communications here as a church. Uh, we needed a better looking website. We needed consistent uh, social media engagement. 
We needed to uh, improve our bulletins and their look. We needed to improve our publicity. And so over the last couple of years, we've discerned the importance of having somebody here full time to serve as a director of communications. <laughs> we created that position here and we were so blessed to find Lisa over there, Lisa Bell, uh, who came to us from All Saints Episcopal Church in Atlanta. We did a national search and we came across Lisa. Um, and she has been with us since the summer. And I am sure that you have noticed the amazing improvement in communications here. I certainly have over my four years. Um, let me remind you a little bit about what it was like, say, in 2018. Uh, we had no weekly emails to people, no reminders of who was serving, uh, no uh, digital announcements that were being sent out to people. Now you have every single week in your inbox, hopefully you're getting it, uh, if you're not, come talk to Lisa, the weekly vine, right? It's beautifully designed. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't design it like that. Beautifully designed, full of information, full of images showing you the life of our church. Um, that emerged over the last four years. Um, the development of our bulletins, much more user-friendly. We had the trifolds. Do you all remember that? Vaguely, some of you. Um, our new, new bulletins are much more user-friendly. You see posters around, beautifully designed posters. Look, look over there and there and there. We had, at best, a spotty engagement with social media. Um, I'm an old millennial, so a lot of the new social media is beyond me. But, um, you know, I, I use Facebook and Instagram every now and then, but we really did not have any kind of regular engagement on social media. And now we've got a strong presence on Facebook, on Instagram, other social media I don't even know about. Uh, I try to follow. Uh, but uh, constantly posting about what's going on in the church, announcements, images from our life, and you can see where we have the analytics from this, an increased engagement from people in our community with this church through our social media. Um, an amazing uh, development for us. And the Rector's Forum here, recorded, put up on YouTube. She curates all of that material. We can now share these videos. Um, this is a, a whole new development for us here on Sunday morning. So these are just some of the ways in which Lisa has changed our communications here. And I hope you have noticed that. Uh, she works very closely with Amanda too, uh, in terms of engaging with people in the community. So I want to give uh, Lisa a round of applause. Thank you. I didn't even, I forgot to mention the website. Oh my goodness, the website. We hear time and time again, the communications, the website, the, the public face of our church is a big reason why people come here. When they search for a church and they see the website and they see our, our social media presence, uh, that's part of what compels them or invites them to come and try us out. So this is quite important. We had another big transition uh, around the middle of last year, which is that our longtime director of music ministries, Daniel Brinson, uh, left after 10 years here. Uh, we were very sad to see Daniel go. He, had, um, he has such a sweet heart and a great gift for music, and he and I had um, a wonderful collaborative relationship together. We still see each other from a, on occasion and text. Uh, with each other, but his departure encouraged us to do some discernment and reflection on what we wanted in our director of music ministries position, um, and what we heard from the congregation through surveys and through uh, engagement with you all was that this church wants to have a strong music program, wants to have uh, choirs for children and youth and a strong adult choir um, and wants to have a musical program that is blended, that draws from uh, the best of the different
Christian traditions uh, in, in the music program. So based on that, we engaged in a national search for a new director of music ministries. And uh, we actually increased the position slightly to make it three quarters time as opposed to half time on Daniel's advice. He said this would really help recruit people and then also allow you to have someone who could go out into the community and build relationships with people and invite them into the choirs and so forth. So we did that. And I have to say, I was really not sure how all this would go. Um, there aren't that many people that play the organ in our country. Uh, someone told me recently there are currently 200 organ majors in the entire United States of America. Um, so I really wasn't sure about this, but um, thanks be to God, we got a ton of applicants. Um, lots and lots of interest. And so we've gone through this search process. We are currently down to our two finalists. And I hope to uh, make a decision sometime in the next day or so about who our next uh, director of music ministries is going to be. So uh, keep uh, your eyes open for that. Look for that email uh, in your inbox at some point this week. And we're hoping that that individual will start um, around Lent in about a month or so, in a month and a half. So this is very exciting, and I, I will tell you that the quality of the candidates was quite high, um, and our new uh, director of music ministries is going to be a great addition uh, to the staff uh, and to this church, and I am very, very excited about what might come from our music program in terms of choral development. And so if you've got young kids and you would like to be exposed to music, uh, we would love to hear you because that's clear from you because that's what we're, we're hoping to do. Okay. So next we have Amanda. Amanda unfortunately can't be with us today. She is uh, in Texas uh, with her family. Um, but Amanda has been with us for a good number of years now. She came uh, in mid-2019 as the Associate Rector. And in her role as the Associate Rector, she obviously shares with uh, me and Father Rick in um, priestly activities, preaching, pastoral care, and so forth. But her ministry focus is primarily on something called invite, welcome, and connect. So she does all of the programming, all of the organization for um, our evangelism work in the community, working with Lisa, especially in that. When people come here, what is their experience like? We have heard from many of you, some of you in this room, saying this is the most welcoming church we've encountered. Uh, the moment we came here, somebody greeted us. There was a process. Uh, Amanda invited us to coffee. Uh, within a week, <laughs> uh, Amanda's drinking a lot of coffee these days, um, and uh, we were we were welcome. We were embraced immediately. Um, that doesn't just happen. It doesn't just you know, magically occur. Most churches say we're a welcoming church, but that's actually not true. Uh, I know that from personal experience, from visiting lots of churches over the years, um, even as a priest, sometimes nobody will say anything to me. Uh, as I visit a new congregation. Um, that is not true here. Somebody is going to talk with you, engage with you, um, and probably pretty quickly invite you to living your faith, our uh, newcomer onboarding program here. We have gone through many of these classes now, and uh, they are a great experience. We've got one going on right now that we just started, another one. Um, so every year we are able to incorporate people who are new to our church into the life of our church very, very quickly. Um, and this is a critical, critical dimension. Amanda has also helped us connect newcomers and people who have been here for a while to various ministries. Uh, help people think through what are my spiritual gifts and how can I use those spiritual gifts to serve God and God's church here. Um, so it has been a great blessing having her with us at the church and having this focus on invite, welcome, connect, a sort of outward focus, I think has worked very well for our congregation. In fact, I will venture to say that if we did not have this, we would not be where we are today. 
we would be a different church because of the pandemic. Um, so looking outward, being focused on the community, being focused on bringing new people into the church has made a big difference. The next step I want to mention um, is Mary Lane, our parish administrator. Some of you know Mary, uh, or have uh, certainly talked to her on the phone. Um, Mary keeps us all on track. She's a straight shooter. She tells it like it is. She's the hub of the staff in many ways. Um, our records are phenomenal here. I, I can't even believe it. During the pandemic, she took all of the physical records and digitized them. She's like, I gotta do something. I gotta use this time well. Got all of those things digitized now. She manages the day-to-day -day facilities issues, which are many. <laughs> Uh, one of our big unexpected expenses, as vestry members can tell you, this past year was HVAC repair. Uh, it seemed like there was always something that had to be dealt with. Um, and one of the great gifts that Mary has brought is that she, she's from this area. She grew up in this area, so she knows all the contractors, all the different companies here, and um, has these great relationships with them. She has even, I see him back there, so I'll mention this, uh, Trevor back here has uh, become our sort of unofficial sexton of late, and uh, he works with uh, Mary. So you might see him. Yeah, stand up. You might see him. Uh, he's a newcomer. Yeah, we'll give him a round of applause. He's put in something like nine to ten hours a week here, um, helping us out with little odd jobs. Uh, you know, he's the tinker in chief here at uh, at the church, and uh, he's been a great blessing to Mary, and they've worked together closely. The other thing, though, we have to say uh, for, for Mary is that in the midst of the transition in the treasure role, she has really stepped up and uh, made a huge difference. She has filled in holes in our accounting, um, having somebody to do the day-to-day -day accounting. She has stepped in, and she's now working with our uh, part-time bookkeeper, Darcy, uh, who's a contractor for our church. And so she'll be working with Lance as they uh, transition in this new way, and uh, that was not part of her job originally, but she saw the need during the pandemic, and she stepped in, and that's the kind of person she is. Um, so if you see Mary around, please thank her for all that she does. You may not see her on Sunday, but she really is like the glue that holds together our church. And lastly, I'll mention Father Rick over there. Uh, he has served as our assistant rector, and this year his role is focusing more on, I think, where your calling is right now, Rick, which is Ministries for Healing. And Rick has said to me, we've discerned together, that he wants to focus more on healing and healing ministries here in this church, and especially the use of liturgical guitar for healing ministries. Um, you may not know this, but uh, Father Rick is a uh, master classical guitarist. Um, absolutely amazing. Well, is master is an official title, isn't it? Maestro. Maestro, okay. <laughs> you have to be certified, everything. Um, and so Father Rick and I decided to uh, make the Wednesday Eucharist, which is at 10 o'clock, a healing service every week. And we do it together now, and Father Rick provides liturgical guitar at this and we offer the laying on of hands and anointing with oil. And this has been really just a wonderful addition. So if you are looking for a healing service, um, come join us on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. Rick is also helping us on Sunday nights uh, over the next couple of months, and we'll be playing uh, liturgical guitar as well every now and then on Sunday nights. You. Because of this sort of new focus, you might not see him as much on Sunday mornings, but you still will see him on occasion preaching and celebrating on Sunday mornings. Okay. So, yes, good, good. So, some of you will know that having a strong and cohesive integrated staff here um, has been one of the things that I have really wanted to focus on in my ministry here. 
Uh, it's something that was communicated to me by the search committee as an essential part, that we needed to work on that and so forth. And I can say to you right now, looking at these names and this staff, um, that we are in the best place that we have been as a staff. Um, there is a closeness, a, um, a connection, a trust. Um, we trust one another, we value one another, and there is a great kind of synergy, if you will, uh, that exists among us. Um, you all are really blessed to have the staff that you have here serving you, and I'm certainly blessed. They make me look good, you know? Um, so I just want to do a round of applause for all of our staff and for some of whom are here. We're in a strong place as a church. We're in a strong place financially. As I said, attendance is coming back. We've got a strong staff. We have a lot to be grateful for. And I think it's probably a good time now to open it up to your specific questions. There's obviously a lot more I could say, but um, what questions do you have for me or for Audie or Lisa or Father Rick, um, or maybe even Lance and Scott back there? Um, what questions do you have? Don't be shy. Yes? Um, you sort of talk about in the past about like, the poker fund and the graveyard fund and the scholarship fund. Yes. Do those things still exist? They do, yes. So one of the things that is really great about our uh, financial situation here is that we have several investment funds um, that we use for different ministry purposes. So one is the Booker Wheat Fund, which has several hundred thousand dollars in it. And we decided a couple of years ago uh, to use that fund to support our mission partnerships at the local level, at the national level, and at the international level. And there's a variety of partnerships that we could talk about, but every year we make uh, grants from the Booker Wheat Fund to support these partnerships. Um, that fund actually had sort of just been sitting there for some years and grants had not been made um, each year. And uh, so under the leadership of Mike Wesson, a Booker Week committee was formed uh, that meets every year now and they take grant applications from our mission partners saying, you know, here's, here's what we're hoping to do this year, here's how you all could support us, you know, a, a regular grant application. And then the committee goes through all of that and decides how to uh, disperse the funds. We have also started using the Tower Fund uh, to support the Booker Weed disbursements. So you may not know this, we have a cell phone tower in our church, uh, in the steeple, and we receive something like $30,000, not quite, but in that neighborhood from uh, the company to have that cell phone tower. And so all that money is also given to the Booker Week group to disperse every year uh, to support our mission partners. So it was something in the neighborhood that's got around $50,000 this year that uh, this church gave out to support our mission partners at all levels, local, national, and international. We have an extensive graveyard fund too, which we use to maintain the graveyard. Um, and a variety of other funds um, as well. So that's another dimension of our life, not just the operating budget, but these additional funds that we can use for ministry. Great, good question. What else? Yes? What about the school? Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. So uh, we are almost able to say that we have uh, an official preschool here at St. Paul's Ivy. Uh, we need to get some final approval from the county for some, um, what is it, an occupancy permit of some kind? Zoning, okay. Uh, we have that meeting this week, actually. So that's that should hopefully we'll get the approval for that. Um, and then we'll apply for our licensure. But the basic point here is that during the pandemic, um, we discerned through uh, the guidance of a couple of parishioners to start a preschool here, which is something that this church had thought about and, and it had been part of the original thinking when the renovations took place in the 90s for the Sunday school classrooms. But we hadn't really found the right arrangement. Um, and uh, Allison Fredlow, 
um, and Melissa came to us and proposed this preschool. They have started a, what we're calling the Bridge Playgroup until we're able to officially have them as our preschool. They've started that. They've been going uh, for one semester now, and there was a ton of interest. We anticipate that in the fall, when they are certainly going to be our official preschool, uh, that they'll be fully enrolled. Um, their maximum enrollment. And the preschool has already gotten interconnected with our church. Several new families have joined the church through the preschool. Okay, we've got some here maybe. Uh, <laughs> over there. Um, so the preschool is um, another way in which we are reaching out to the community. So everything is, is on track for that. And we should be able to say, hopefully within a couple of months, that uh, it is the official St. Paul's Ivy Preschool. Um, so that's really good news. Yeah. Yes? Can you uh, tell us some of the missions that we're supporting? Sure, yes. So as I mentioned, we have uh, mission partnerships at three different levels, local, national, and international. Um, let's start with international. So our international mission partnership is with uh, Nizali, which is a, a town in um, Tanzania, and also with the diocese that Nizali is part of, the Diocese of Central Tanganyika. Um, that ministry has existed for at least 10 years now, I think. Uh, 12? Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, at least, at least uh, over a decade. And um, just this past year, we went through a uh, discernment process to reimagine that ministry. Kind of its first phase had gone through its normal life cycle, and now it's time to think about how can we uh, partner with this group in a new way. And uh, we'll share more of this with you when it's completely finalized, but our direction now is to go in sustainable agriculture. And we have uh, repartnered with the Diocese of Central Tanganyika to support that work. Um, so you'll hopefully hear more about that, and then I think we're going to hopefully go send a, send a group there in 2024. Um, we haven't been able to have um, groups from our church go to Tanzania because of the pandemic, but the hope is that that will start up again. Um, at the national level, we are in partnership with the St. James Episcopal School in um, Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia. Our youth will be going there on mission. Uh, this summer. They'll be on their second mission trip there. And um, some very exciting things are being discussed about perhaps kids from the school coming down here to Charlottesville um, and having an experience here in Charlottesville. and something that we as a church can put together and host. Uh, so more on that in the future. Um, but we are trying to deepen this relationship and this connection. Locally, uh, there are a variety of different ministries. There's uh, Georgia's Friends, which uh, assists women in recovery. Um, we are looking at deepening our relationship with Habitat for Humanity and their uh, project at Southwood. Um, we have a partnership with uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church just uh, down the road, and they uh, join us for the monthly food pantry that we put on here. Um, I'm sure there are others that, I, that I'm blanking on. Yeah. What about the prison ministry? Prison ministry. We do not have a uh, partnership in prison ministry. We've had individuals come and speak here, but we don't have an established partnership. Yet. I think there may be some parishioners who volunteer, but uh, not an official church ministry. Yes? Uh, what's your vision for the next five years? My vision for the next five years uh, is that we as a church uh, will grow in our knowledge and love of God. Um, I'd like to see this church continue to reach the new people that are moving to this area, the unbelievable demographic explosion. There are clearly many people who are hungering for a sense of meaning and purpose in their life, and I think the church can offer them. I think the church matters. Um, obviously, we're in competition with a lot of other uh, activities in our society, but um, but this is important, and I think we offer something unique that, that others uh, don't. I'd like to see our church um, engage more in service as well, bringing 
parishioners more and more into uh, roles here at the church. There are many ways that you can serve here, whether on Sunday morning or in one of our mission partnerships. Um, I don't think of that as volunteering. I don't even really like the word volunteering. I think of that as Christian discipleship. What are your gifts? What are your callings? How can you serve? Um, maybe it's serving as a reader, right? Um, that is a, a gift. That is something that we need. Uh, that's how we as a church can flourish. So my invitation to you all would be to think about what is God calling me to do at this time in my life? Um, Lee, I see you over there, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, Lee came to me when he joined and said, you know, look, my calling is to serve as a verger. Have you ever considered having a verger guild? And here we are, what, three, four years later, we've got six fully trained vergers serving on Sunday morning who have become a regular part of our life. And thanks be to God that they, uh, they are there, because I don't know what I would do on Sunday without them. Um, but what a great ministry, right? And that was something that, you know, he said, this is my calling. This is my, my vocation. So th that's, in general, where I'd like to see us go. Um, I'd like to see us also have a robust uh, music program um, and really develop that, maintain our strengths with our children's and youth program. Um, and I would say continue also developing our adult formation, um, bringing people here and then having activities throughout the year as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. Audie. I don't have a question, but I do want to real quickly say thank you to mm -hmm. all the parents who have um, supported me and brought their children because the children can't get here themselves, so it's really important that the parents are involved in this process. And Ron McCall, will you please stand up because Ron has been actually a more quiet uh, person here helping me with so many small projects, whether it was building the new set for the pageant, helping with some of the things that we need to um, modify for our preschool that we're developing. There's just so many uh, things that Ron does that no one knows about, and it's one of those like, I just broke something. Can you come fix it before I get in trouble? He's, um, he's our carpenter in residence. He so also you. built a whole stage out yes. there when we needed that in the pandemic. Yeah, so thank you, Matt. Oh, Kevin, yes. Because Kevin is also one of those people who uh, verbalized an interest uh, and desire to serve in working with youth. And so he joins me on Sunday nights and helps me uh, try to create a fun and balanced experience, young and young and old, um, <laughs> male and female, and all that fun stuff. But Kevin has been a real gift uh, to the youth program. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Well, I think we've come to the end of our uh, time. Um, certainly, if you have other questions, reach out to me, any of the staff members, um, but to hopefully have a good sense of who the staff are here and what their various roles are, um, and uh, they'd be happy to help you. All right. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks for that.